figuring out how data moves from one part of the application to another, one part of the code to another can be really tough, especially for newer developers. If you take a peek under the hood of most games, open up the code, you'll find a bunch of separate parts glued together, working to make up the whole. It's not unlike popping the hood to your car. It's all one big machine, separate parts connected together with tubes, hoses, pipes, bolts. When dealing with code, those parts are made up from functions, classes, modules, packages, data structures, or other things, depending on your programming language of choice or game engine of choice. Then if you open up one of those parts, you might even find more little parts inside of a subsystem. When it comes to Game Maker, we have a few choices for breaking up our games into smaller pieces, easier to understand pieces, but the main option is objects. For example, say we're writing a simple platformer, we could put all of that code into one single script. It'd be difficult to read and edit and test over time as it gets bigger, or we could break out objects that are easier for us to work with. But once we set up all of these individual objects, how do they talk to each other? I'm going to talk about three different approaches for communication between these objects. Let's do it. Let's start with a really simple example of just a player and a health bar. So our player is going to have a hit points variable. For now, it's just an instanced variable directly on the object. Then for the health bar in the draw event, we are going to draw some hearts on the screen based off of the player's hit points. But the problem here is that right now, health bar can't see hit points. It doesn't know what the variable hit points actually means. The simplest, most obvious solution here would be to make hit points global. So over on our player object, change it to global.hitpoints. Then over in our health bar, we can update it to reference global.hitpoints. This is approach number one, what we can call shared global state because the data that is shared between these two components, these two objects are in the global scope. I'm sure you've seen debates about using globals before. One big benefit of this method is that it is really easy to implement. You don't need to deal with scoping issues, like which part of the code has access to which data or which variables, but it can lead to confusing bugs and harder to test code. Since any code can manipulate global state, it's hard to track down which code is doing what, especially in the case of silent errors. But honestly, I think this is a okay method for very small games. But as our game expands, things are going to get more complicated. As of now, health bar is the only object that is referencing health, but naturally, more things are going to need access to health. For example, you might have a trap object, an enemy object, an item object. Each one of these may, for example, decrease health from the player. One of the difficult things with globals is since it's directly manipulating hit points, if we ever need to have some sort of behavior when hit points hits zero, for example, everywhere that manipulates hit points is also going to need a check for that behavior. In this case, it's just if hit points hit zero, then game over. It'd be nice to move that directly into the player object so that player is always in control of that behavior of when hit points hit something, we want some other thing to happen. Here's a simple example of that. So in player create, you have two instance variables for hit points and max hit points. We have a restore health function, which is going to add health to the player limited by the max hit points. Then we're also going to have a damage health function. This will decrement hit points down to zero. And in the case where we want to add in that some sort of behavior around hit points, then we can do it in one place. Players in control of hit points, 
we expect all other code to go through restore health or damage health. So we can trust that if we add in the behavior here, where if hit points is less than or equal to zero, then game over, then it makes our code simpler, more predictable. There's less chance for us to accidentally introduce some sort of funky behavior. But since we are taking away the globals, we need to go back to our health bar, figure out another way to get hit points. So one way is we can use something like instance find. There are a handful of functions already available in Game Maker for finding instances in the game. In this case, we're just finding the first instance of OBJ player. Then in our draw hearts function, we can reference player dot hit point instead of global hit points. This is approach number two, direct instance access. This is another method that is pretty easy to implement, just finding the instance, but it does tightly couple two components together. So for example, health bar is tightly coupled with player now, which makes it difficult to reuse health bar in any other scenario. It always is looking for player. It always needs it. This also makes things like automated testing a little bit more difficult because you always have to initialize all of the dependencies. But it's another good method for small, simple games. You can scale it pretty far. Let's look at an example of creating a couple instances of health bar and player. So I'm just going to initialize player using instance create depth. And then I'm also going to initialize a health bar object. In this case, these two things would work fine. Health bar has what it needs. It's looking for player. You can grab it, grab the hit points and draw the hearts onto the screen. But like I just mentioned, reusability gets hurt a bit in this case. So if we try to insert just the health bar onto the screen without any instance of a player, you get this. This is what I mean by tight coupling. Health bar is always looking for player. It always needs it. You can't reuse it in other parts of your code easily. We can see that if we create an example where we have a player with a health bar, but we also want a boss or an enemy to use the same health bar component. Naturally, I mean, it would make a lot of sense. We don't want to have a different health bar component per type or per object, it would be nice to have a generic one. But in this case, player health is going to find the first instance of player, but boss health is also going to find the first instance of player. So how can we get around this? Looking at our health bar component and its code, we have the instance find line, which is looking for OBJ player. If we have two instances of player or another object that we want to use health bar for, it's still always going to find the zeroth index of player. So instead of referencing player, we can reference just a general variable on health bar called target. So you'll see draw hearts target dot hit points. And then we can actually inject target into health bar when we are initializing it. So in this case, we could do instance create depth and then pass in a struct with target and player one. This is something you can think about as reversing dependencies. So instead of health bar depending on player, health bar reaching out and finding player, we're reversing the dependency. So now when you create health bar, you have to give it the target. So back to our player boss example, we can inject the player into our player health bar, which is going to point to player naturally. But then on our boss health bar, we can separately inject in the boss instance. And then that's going to change its behavior and point it towards the boss. And as long as the target has that hit points variable on it, it will still work. So you can see as you start implementing some of these more advanced methods, the code does become more complicated, but also more flexible. So we're 
constantly trying to think about that trade-off. Let's check out another example here. I'm going to create an inventory object. It's really simple, a single variable called items, which is just an empty array to start. And then under our player step event, I'm going to check for collisions with a parent object called consumable. If it finds it, then it's going to run a function method called pickup on whatever consumable our player runs into. And then we will set up a relic object, which is going to be a child of consumable. And then we will write out a pickup method for it. So whenever a player hits that relic and pickup runs, it's going to reach out and find an instance of inventory and player. Then it's going to update the inventory by pushing itself into the inventory items, stores the player health, and then destroy itself off, you know, the ground after the player picks it up. Now, again, like in our last example, we're creating dependencies. So Relic depends directly on inventory and player, which comes with all of those normal pitfalls. It makes Relic not reusable, it depends on inventory and player when you put it into a scene. So we can try our little reversing dependency trick and within pick up on the relic, have inventory and player come through as arguments. And then over on the player side, our player can be responsible for getting the inventory and then obviously it already has a reference to itself. So it can pass those along to the pick up a method. So that helps a little bit. Feels a bit more natural for player to have reference to inventory than the consumable finding the inventory itself, especially considering we're going to have a lot of these consumable type of items. But we can break those dependencies even further by using events. So let's assume we have an event publish and an event subscribe. In our consumable, we will publish two events, a restore health event and an add inventory event. And then on the other side, we can subscribe. So for example, inventory can subscribe and anytime an add inventory event fires, it can grab the context from it and update itself, update its own items. Similarly for player, it can subscribe to the restore health event grab the context and restore its own health. So now actually in this case, consumable doesn't even know about inventory or player. It has 100% broken any sort of dependency between the two. This is something that we call broadcasting or pub sub, publish subscribe, event handler. There's kind of a lot of different names for this type of pattern, but a diagram I feel is a bit more helpful. So let's draw out, we have inventory, player, and consumable. Consumable has a reference to inventory and player in our original implementation of this because it's using instance find inventory and player. And like I said, small games, this is not something I would worry about too much. Yes, there is that hard dependency. Yes, it's a little bit tougher to test, not necessarily reusable, but for small games, you're probably not trying to reuse these components or you can just kind of manually work around those issues. Maybe you do just make copies of them for different scenarios and you only end up with a few copies because your game's very small. But you can imagine as you add more and more objects like this, those dependencies get tighter and tighter. There's more of them. Everything gets a bit more complicated. So if we readjust this a bit, and introduce our event manager. Then we can start to decouple these objects from each other and pass everything through the event manager to communicate between objects. So for example, consumable fires that event via event publish, which is passed up into our event manager and then event manager finds all of our subscribers. In this case, our OBJ player because it called event subscribe. So as consumable publishes event, event manager passes it back down to its subscribers. In this case, just player. So now previously where consumable 
had two hard dependencies on inventory and player. It now just has a single dependency on event manager. So it's a little bit of a win if we go from two dependencies to one. But again, this is really for larger games, more complicated code, where you have a spider web of dependencies. It could be dozens, it could be hundreds, and you're trying to break all of those bonds and have these objects be as self-contained as possible to make it easy to reuse, to test, etc. Now I'll put up the code for the event manager here. I don't want to go too deep into it just because this video is not about the implementation of an event manager system. Overall, it's really just a struct that gets functions registered to it based off of string keys. So for example, there is an event string key called restore health, and then there are functions that get associated with that string. So then when it needs to go through and find all of these subscribers, it iterates over all of the functions that are attached to that key, and then just calls those functions with the given content. And of course, like everything, this method has pros and cons. It does strongly decouple. It does create more testable components, but the downside is implementation is harder. Your code will get more complicated. Often you will need tooling for these types of event systems because they can be difficult to debug. It's a little bit more abstract about what's happening with the behavior of code. When event fires, you can't just pull up the function and see what other functions it's calling. It all gets passed up through this abstracted out system. But for large games, overall, it, it really does simplify things. So that's it, that's a few approaches. Hope it's helpful. Thanks for checking it out and I'll see y'all later.